I'm going to try the jingle again. Are we? Are we? I think we should use Matt's version. Uh, okay. Uh, well, well, I sensibly didn't delete it. I mean, it doesn't have a tune, but... <laughs> Claire and Andy in the morning. I got Matt's three questions for crew video up, did you notice? I did. I did. And um, I've even bought a gimbal so I can record things better on my phone. Uh -huh. I haven't got enough, like... <laughs> Glory to Hypnog. <laughs> it came up again today. Anyway, so um, I, I've gone for uh, ah, very, very, very sweet. What was the traditional PD coffee stain? <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to Claire and Andy in the morning. Claire and Andy in the morning. You didn't even try and join in that time, I know. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't. You didn't count us in. <laughs> Fair enough. Claire and Andy in the morning. Yeah, now you didn't How's count that? us in. So Okay, so we both <laughs> said Claire and Andy in the morning. So, But you you're, you're such around. a video expert, I'm sure you can splice those together somehow. No. <laughs> <laughs> right, I thought that because last time we talked about one of my areas, but this time we should talk about one of yours. Um, what did you have in so, mind, as if we haven't discussed it? <laughs> well, originally I thought we should talk about Windsor War and Windsor Fortune, mm -hmm. but I think really if we're talking that, we should just chat plot in general. Okay, fair enough. Um, where do you want to start? I mean, do you want to start talking about Winds of Fortune and Winds of War, or what plot is, or or something? Go on, tell us what plot is then, and why it's important. Oh, okay. Small, quest uh, small questions. Mm, is it important though? I think we could have an entire discussion about whether it's actually important or not. But it's stuff happening. It's stuff happening. For the most part, it's stuff happening because... Uh, somebody at PD has put some effort into making it happen. So, uh, arguably, elections and uh, and, and uh, the decisions of the Senate and the Synod, the Conclave and the Military Council is plot, the battle is a plot. Um, all those eternal audiences that the Conclave puts together are plot. The, the MPCs the decisions are sent out to the field. I'm oh, sorry. The decisions aren't plot, though. The decisions are what the players choose to do, but quite often those decisions are in response to plot. Yeah, that's fair, and that's where Winds of Fortune and Winds of War come in. Um, because we've got quite a few players and a comparatively small team of uh, plot writers and NPCs, what we try and do is front load as much plot as possible prior to the event, which is where Winds of War and Winds of Fortune come in. Winds of War are a, a hopefully evocative great word uh an evocative um write-up of what's happened with the various uh military campaigns that the empire is involved in over the previous downtime as a result of the decisions made by the military council and those are usually straightforward they usually come out quite quickly uh and they will often set up the um the battles that are going to take place during the event or at least the choices of battles um, so they're they're composed of a sort of beautiful write-up of what happened and then uh, a boring fact a little bit, yeah? Uh, kind of. We, we've we recently tried a new thing, which is where we're trying to incorporate the story of why the battles are taking place into the narrative as well. Um, but yes, and at the end, there'll be a game information section that will say something like, I don't know, uh, this territory is now 50% under the control of the Empire or... If you were one of the military, if your military unit supported this battle, here is a special option you might want to take advantage of to 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 get involved with it. Um, stuff like that. Uh, so what so happens? I assume Graham gives you a big lump of data. Oh, for Winds of War, uh, there's actually a, there's actually a thing on the wiki somewhere I think that goes through how what happens with the downtown campaign in Winds of War. I might link it in the uh, description below if I remember. Uh, but basically, um, at the event the generals discuss and then give orders to their armies after the event graham feeds the orders that the armies have taken into the spreadsheet where we've already got the uh decisions that the barbarian armies have taken and then he uses yes yeah, so before we leave the field on friday before you even know what the generals uh, have decided yeah, you yeah. have a conversation don't you uh one of my About... one of my jobs is to absolutely definitely not know what's going on in the military council um, because Graham is in the military council, he can't avoid that. And because Matt 
is in so many different places and people talk to him all the time he he will sometimes find out what's going on but part of my job is to definitely not know what they are what the players are doing <laughs> um and we'll often have a very we'll often have a, a broad strategic plan for each of the orc uh, for each of the barbarian nations before the event starts because part of that plays into various things that happen during the event and then after the event bef uh, almost immediately after the event in fact we will nail down the orc orders yeah, so when you say immediately, you mean within a couple of hours of time out? Within a couple of hours, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Graham and I will generally start on that at about half past three, four o'clock. Um, and once they're all nailed down, Graham tells us what the players are doing, and we have a lot of fun speculating on how it's going to come out. Because obviously, we can't know what the outcomes are going to be. We can guess, but we can't know what the outcome is going to be until the uh, end of downtime when the players who've got military units um, are being able to make their decisions about where they send their, their military units. So there's, there'll often be... Uh, regularly there'll be one uh, one theatre, one campaign where it is close and it's and it's all going to come down to uh, how many military units turn up there. And then Graham bangs the numbers together and then he and I have a meeting uh, with a spreadsheet um, and we go through each of the campaigns and he explains what's happened in the numbers and I ask him a bunch of questions like <laughs> how big a role did this fortification play? Um what impact would the orders have had if they'd done something different that sort of stuff so i've got a baseline from which to build a wind of war uh and then i go away and do a lot of writing stuff looking at uh, territory write-ups and thinking about armies and looking at the orders that generals have physically written down uh to build a narrative up and then i over the course of two or three days lock myself in a cupboard uh with a lot of coffee and i write however many winds of war we decide we need usually one player theater and then we put them all up over the course, as I say, of a day or so. So what what's was the most shocking when you've done? What oh. was the most unexpected outcome? Let me think. Um, uh, I have a soft spot for the sack of Sarvos when the Grendel uh, Armada just turned up in Sarvos and invaded <laughs> it. Um, the the Druze invasion of Zenith um, is one that surprised me a bit. Uh, well, not surprised me a bit, but, but, but that, was, that was designed to be shocking. Um, there was a fascinating wind of war early on in which a, a Dornish army ran the entire length of the empire to uh, to help a uh, to help a brass coast empire fight the Lysambrian orcs. That was a lot of fun. Um, oh, and the Black Thorns. There was a whole period of time where trying to work out what the Black Thorns were going to be doing each event was uh, was a challenge. And occasionally they'd be in Horde Land. Oh, was when they head further and further off yes, into... Yeah, uh, where they headed further yeah. off. Um, so we, we had some nice stuff actually with a couple of new player groups who, whose entry into player empire involved that. What the Blackthorns and the Horderland thing? Yes, because we we had a couple of groups whose background was that they'd been trapped in Horderland ah, since right, okay. some time and um, managed to get back because the Blackthorns suddenly turned up. You can choose to know as much of it as you want. Can't oh, you? yeah, yeah, that's that's a key with Winds of War and Winds of Fortune. When we did um, when we did our, one of our earlier games, Maelstrom, um, we had this uh, uh, we had this complicated downtime system that would determine which pieces of text each character would get uh, printed out onto A5 pieces of paper and then stuffed into an envelope, uh, and it would do things like if you were if you were in a certain square on the map, it would tell you that a battle had taken place. <laughs> if you weren't in that square, but were in the square next door, you would be utterly oblivious to the fact that that, <laughs> that, that had happened. So we looked at all of that and we thought, uh, bugger that for a game of soldiers. It's a huge amount of work and it just isn't working. So instead what we do is with Winds of War and with Winds of Fortune, we just throw everything up and say, this is... This is what you can know if you want. If you're not interested in what's going on in Surma Suak, don't read it. If you are interested in what's going on in Surma Suak, it's up to you to, if you want to explain how you know what's going on. Um, but we have things like we have the Navarre um, who, in the setting, spend a lot of time bringing news between uh, from one end of the Empire to the other. And of course, we've got printing presses uh, in the League that produce newspapers. So there's plenty of opportunity for a carrot to justify why they know what's going on on the far end of the Empire. Um, and I prefer that. I mean, it's just, we don't, I'm trying to think how to phrase it right. You don't benefit from knowing what's in Winds of War and you're not disadvantaged for not knowing what's in Winds of War. 
in general, I guess. I don't know. You you talk to more players than I do. What's your opinion? Yes. So Winds of War are the reporting on what the Barbies have done in the last damn time. Yeah. So so they're a lot more factual. Not not factual. They're a lot. They're that this has happened, and there there might be something you can do in response to that. But it's or it might the response to it might be the choice of battles at the event or something like that. Winds of Fortune, I think, are the more personal ones. So Winds of Fortune are a, are a, re, are a different kettle of fish, I think. Um, each Wind of Fortune sets up something that is happening in the game world. Um, and it will it will usually start with a nice piece of flavour text. Um, I'll come back to flavour text if I remember in a little bit, because there's some nuance there. Um, and then it Do you want me to be... write it down so I remember? Uh, no, don't, don't worry about it. If we can't remember, <laughs> it wasn't that important. I can always edit it in later. Um... You've made me forget what I was saying now. So it starts off with a piece of flavour text. And for me, that's one of the fun bits of writing it. We really enjoy writing the flavour text. Uh, we usually do it at the end after we've written the rest of the Wind of Fortune. And it's like a break from number juggling. Then we'll have a pretty factual write-up about what's going on. Nothing we say in the body of a Wind of Fortune is going to be uh, a lie. That's a big thing of ours, isn't it? They not, don't lie to players. Yes, yeah. It comes from one of our one of our plot writing guidelines is you shouldn't trick players, mostly because uh, Matt explains this better than I do. Um, but it's really easy to trick players if you're the organisers because you, they look at you to help determine what is true and what isn't. Um, Matt tells a story about NPCs claiming the sky is green and players having to find refs to check. Because perhaps the sky yeah. is green, because an NPC has said it is. But anyway, so so it's reasonably truthful. And what it'll do is it'll set up a situation or it will report on something that's going on. Um, and then usually we'll lay out a couple of obvious steps that people could take um, to interact with this, to deal with it. So, for example, we might say a really straightforward, some of the earliest Winds of Fortune were very, were very much in this sort of vein. Uh, there's been a green iron strike in uh to sato if the synod encourages people to to look into getting green iron all the mines in the territory will get more green iron but there'll be less people buying cakes and so the businesses will suffer but if the senate passes a motion and spends a load of white granite they could build uh, i don't know a green iron accelerator that will fire lumps of green <laughs> iron at each other in a giant <laughs> circular thing underneath to sato and that will produce magical pineapples for everybody i know and we lay those out. And a lot of the time we'll also say things like, um, it, there's plenty of other stuff you can do as well. There, there might be all sorts of other things. We'll often do a wind of fortune, which we say, here are the problems. Um, here is some of the repercussions for not sorting these problems out. Uh, we've no idea how you're going to sort these problems out particularly, but, you know, good luck. Off you go. Off you go. So winds of fortune, while they happen at an event, they may have a knock-on effect that takes more than one event to solve. Uh, Oh, yes, we've we've regularly had sort of Wind of Fortune arcs kind of thing, and that mm, it's interesting. If it's sort of that we we often use Winds of Fortune to frame our our ongoing plots. So some obvious examples are um, a plot writer came to us with an idea for a for a Red Star, the Red Star plot, in which there was mm -hmm. this new Red Star in the sky, and the sky is very important to some of our magicians and so on and so forth. And over the course of a year, this Red Star got closer, and then it went full on comet in Moominland. Uh, and suddenly, it, instead of it just making people feel a bit weird and being ominous, uh, it's going to slam into the empire and cause devastating damage in Varushka unless something is done about it. And then there was a lot of politics and it was nudged off course by imperial magicians uh, and it slammed somewhere else and, and things happened and there was politics. And, and basically, this wind of fortune is like the, the, the scaffolding that we're building uh, a specific plot. Uh, along so our plot writer was uh, was busy running stuff on the field about uh, observatories and people being influenced by the star and we were supporting that with our window fortune and anybody who read that window fortune could know as much or as little as they wanted about that um, and at the same time it was reasonably legitimate to just turn up with a with no idea what was going on and simply ask people what's what's with this red star thing uh, that's that's what i like about winds of fortune in particular it applies to winds of war too but less so i think is that if you're a new player you can pick a wind of fortune and make it your thing to find out about at the event 
Yeah. Um, we tag them these days, and we do our level best to, to make those tags relevant. We'll often tag them by a nation or a specific group of people, or in rare cases, a specific person who ought to pay attention to it. So one of the things you can do is instead of reading, I mean, I do a word count after every um after every event and between us we write a small novel every event uh but you don't nobody needs to read all of that apart from obviously me and matt because we have to write it um uh, but you can just <laughs> scroll down the list on the winds of fortune page looking for for example varushka the old varushka look for the winds of the fortune that are tagged varushka and then have a skim on them and see if they're in any way of interest to you and we'll do the same yeah, thing so, so. so they, they go up on the website about mm. two to three weeks before an event it it, it it can vary a lot will depend on what else is going on at the same time but our aim is to try and get them all up and finished uh at the latest the week before the event we're not always successful with that unfortunately but we we try uh but they will go up they will go up over a period of time uh so we don't just put you know twenty thousand words up in one and when they when they go up we put a notification on the facebook group don't uh, we? yes it's one of the things that for me particularly builds a bit of hype running into the event uh we put all the winds of fortune up usually uh, sorry winds of war up over a over usually a day perhaps two days uh and we'll accompany that with um posts to our facebook page um using photos of people from the events fighting um uh, and that's often really nice and we'll i will do my level best to put them up in an order that creates maximum uh drama uh and nail there's, there's usually one isn't there that everybody is looking forward to <laughs> there, is, there is usually one that is like we need to know what happened here uh, i'm not quite that cynical we will we will often reverse expectation by putting up the one everybody cares about first and getting it out of the way but but we, but we, view, them, we view them as a way to to help people get their enthusiasm up for the event that's coming even the bad ones aren't aren't designed to make players feel bad they're designed to make players feel angry at the enemy so that they want to get out there and get them beaten so by bad you mean bad outcome for the empire yeah bad outcome for the empire uh, I'm, I'm one of those horrible people who doesn't think there's any bad outcomes as long as there's drama and things to care about and things to do. So, the, yeah, yeah. LARP is about making, legitimately being allowed to make and revel in your bad life choices. <laughs> and then <laughs> after, uh, then we'll start with Winds of Fortune. We'll trickle them out um, and they will, we'll often have a vague plan about the order to get them put up in and there'll be a theme to it, but but it's not anywhere near as tight as Winds of War is. And they'll go up over a period of time. And then these days, they normally start with the Wind of Fortune that's about the plenipotentiary meetings that the art mages have arranged with uh, certain Eternals. So a plenipotentiary is one of the abilities the arch mages yeah, have. Yeah, sorry, yes. Which is that they can, they can send a message to a specific Eternal uh, in for, their yeah, realm. Yeah. Yes. And they they will get a response. They will get a response. Sometimes the response is uh, up yours, uh, but they will get a response, and we will always put those responses up in our window fortune. Uh, and that's interestingly, actually thinking about the art mage. The art mage is an example of one of our approaches to plot. So we commit every event to providing six discrete pieces of plot that will be aimed at the magicians of the empire, and what form those plots take is determined by the art mages effectively. So if there's a plot going on with Lofi, for example, this is something that's happened in play, the Art Mage can, uh, can communicate with Lofi at the previous event and say, we want to talk face to face about what's going on in Rykos. Um, and then at the next event, we will run an encounter with Lofi or representative of Lofi, usually, sometimes not, but usually, in which the Art Mage and the people that they've pulled together will get a chance to role play about that. But if there's simultaneously a plot going on with Yorna Gra or Uhura, then we intentionally create a circumstance where the spring art mage's ability is partly going to determine how those plots unfold. Mm -hmm. um, and we leave it up to that art mage to determine which eternal they think is the most important to speak to at any given point. And that creates drama and it creates interactions between, uh, between players and... Uh, we did a uh, Matt and I did a whole podcast actually, a well, podcast video cast about this recently when we were doing the title stuff. I'll probably stick a, a link at the end of the video to it because titles are one of the ways that we uh, we give players the ability to to, to shape plot. Uh, anyway, we will do Winds of Fortune and we'll have some that are 
um, that are common. So I mentioned trade winds, which would be this is what's going on with the foreign nations, uh, for example. And we'll usually end up with the last wind of fortune will probably be the winds of magic. The winds of magic. Uh, winds which, of magic. The winds of magic. Which <laughs> summarise all the grab bag of weird magical effects that we haven't had time to put in anywhere else. And in between that, there'll be a whole range of things. There'll be, uh, there'll be, for example, there might be a wind of fortune about something that's happening in one part of a of a nation or in a territory, or there might be an entire empire-wide effect that's happened because some wizards at the previous event have cast a spell, um, or we might be offering an opportunity or creating a puzzle. There's a load of different ways that they can go. Um, and we try and make each one as interesting and... Uh, interactable with as possible and then once we hit the event we'll often support wind of fortune with field events with things that are going on in the field people to talk mm -hmm. to uh, even something as simple as two groups of npcs who disagree about wind of fortune to go out onto the field and whip up some enthusiasm but often it would be a lot more like we'll tell people in advance for example that a trader is going to be turning up to speak to the brass coast about selling them um i don't know cyclotron parts so they can build a giant green iron cyclotron underneath uh, underneath segura um and then we're we'll into in building things under things in this i'm trying to use crazy examples uh <laughs> and i was uh and i was reading an article about the cern super collider kern super collider <laughs> earlier i saw it's in my head uh, and that's winds of fortune and that is one of our one of our main vectors for pushing plot into the game so that people turn up knowing roughly what's going on um, it's not our only vector for plot, but that is our, our big solid vector that is public and everybody can see it happening. So, asking the hard-hitting question. Go on then. Which do you prefer writing, Winds of War, Winds of Fortune? Hmm. On the whole, I prefer the challenge of Winds of Fortune. Um, each Wind of Fortune is, is its own unique little thing. Matt and I will have long discussions about how best to present something, about ways that people can interact with it, about setting up opportunities, about ways we can make it cooler, ways we can get players involved. Winds of War is much more like uh, just a report, basically. Sometimes there'll be things you can do, um, and I'll often end up in a discussion with Matt and Graham about whether I can offer a certain opportunity to people uh, or whether I can present a certain situation um, or how I can how I can present certain things that have happened in the downtime because the actual downtime battles themselves are very much two big numbers are bashed together and then there's two more numbers left at the end of them it, it, we're, we're very pleased with that but it is basically very straightforward and the winds of war is about creating the cool and helping people frame the numbers being smashed together and making them care about the outcomes uh, and i enjoy winds of war but i think on the whole i prefer winds of fortune because they're often more fun if i was better i'd have written that on a bit of paper so i could have held it up when you said it what because i thought you'd say winds of fortune did you okay yeah well i think it's i think yeah i also get an opportunity to write different types of flavor text for Winds of Fortune. Oh, Wind of Fortune flavor text. Good point. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, one of the reasons we write the flavor text is the actual body of a Wind of Fortune is uh, is factual as much as we can possibly make it. Uh, we might say that people aren't sure or that there are different opinions or what have you and suggest some uncertainties, but we'll never actually say something that isn't true in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll also try and do it in a neutral voice. We have a certain voice we use for writing Winds of Fortune. Uh, but when it comes to the Winds of Fortune flavour text, we just treat them as a bit of fiction that's happening in the game world. Uh, and you it's up to you whether you know about it. Often there'll not be anything to know about, but we'll, we'll often present a, a way of thinking about the Wind of Fortune or an attitude that isn't obvious, that isn't a neutral voice. Um, so we'll we'll present uh, one of my favourite Winds of Fortune flavour text has a has a Wintermark dad telling his son that the way of virtue isn't important, and we could never do that in the body text of a Wind of Fortune, but that is an attitude that I think is interesting to explore if you're from uh, if you're from Wintermark who have a previous religion to the to the way. And so we can put that in a yeah. flavor text because it's just a story. It's not saying you should feel like this. It's saying here is a thing that you could. Yeah, you, you always put like a cut scene in, don't you? Mm. Where you go to yes. a village in the marches where they're talking about how it affects them locally. Yep. Or uh, one Matt did, I remember that was uh, was very similar. Had uh, was just a just a framing sequence in which some um, some wise ones in near Karova are discussing the fact that a that a comet is going to slam into the uh, into the empire. 
uh, it wasn't in Mirkarova, my apologies, it was in Karov, saying a comet's going to slam into the Empire, it's going to happen in Mirkarova. Is it going to affect us? No. Okay, well, let's move on to the next <laughs> agenda point then. <laughs> um, and there'll often, be, uh, there'll often be a bit of subtext. So that one was about pointing out to people that this was not an end-of-the-world scenario. Mm -hmm. This was going to be bad for the people of Mikarova and could be bad for the empire as a whole because Mikarova is a wealthy territory. But if you lived in the territory next door, it wasn't going to directly affect you at all. So it's perfectly legitimate for you to say, what has Mikarova done for us recently? Um, (laughs) I I suppose it's also good to remind people that there are people in the empire. uh, Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, That's often a way to do it. We might take a, a stance that we think is going to be unpopular or that players may... If they want to take it themselves, they will receive opposition too, and we will explicitly say this is a legit interpretation of what is going on with these events, with this plot, um, like that. Yeah, because popular in Anvil doesn't necessarily mean popular in the Empire. No, it doesn't. Um, and while we would, and while we try generally not to say to the players you shouldn't have that viewpoint because the people in your territory think otherwise, what is important from the point of view of creating reasons to interact with other is not to have this idea that there's only one possible response to a plot that, that that everybody has to think about the good of the empire when in fact the game is designed so that you are constantly weighing the good of the empire against the good of me my nation my territory my city and my group um because if it's cut and yes dry, the, the no important plot. thing is to think about your decision not just make it yeah yeah, yeah, we want people to think about it and talk about it. Making the decision is a key part of the process, but the interaction that happens before you make the decision and the interaction that happens as consequences of the decision are, in my opinion, where the plot really lives. Um, I say that's basically our game, isn't it? Uh, yeah, basically it is our game. <laughs> um, and sometimes that means that a plot falls on its arse. We've, uh, we've had so many things that, 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 that we've tried to do or that we've put forward that have failed uh, either because players don't care about them or because the players who do care about them decide to do something else or get talked out of it or because an NPC uh, meets the wrong people or in one case because an NPC is killed five minutes after walking onto the field in a misunderstanding. Oh. Um, and and that's just one of the things that happens. Um, if you want cool, I'm going to use a buzzword and say emergent narrative, which is basically Ooh. what we're aiming for. We want stories that happen because all sorts of lots and lots of different things players events stories everything are slamming together and bouncing off each other and making a story happen in play rather than having a story in advance that we want to tell it's been a lot of me talking what are you talking well, I, about I, I, I find it really interesting because um plot writing isn't one of my strengths i, I like watching the stories happen um so I, I i like seeing how everything interacts and how everything builds and i love the fact that I th- I think he genuinely can change what's happening as a player. I do I do think your actions have consequences. So there's a the the red comet plot actually that I mentioned earlier is an example of things um, we put into the hands of the players a definite guaranteed ritual that meant that they could determine where that comet hit. And there was a plot that went with that that suggested a certain outcome could happen. But because of the way we designed it, uh, they could have dropped that comet anywhere in the Empire, basically, if they really wanted to. Uh, They could even have dropped it in a couple of places that weren't technically in the Empire and contained enemy armies. And we worked out very roughly what would happen if that happened. And we just left the players do it. Um, I know there there was a movement with that comet to see what happened if you dropped it on a Valon. Would it kill the Valon? Um... Uh, and we we were we were fascinated behind the behind the hedge to see where that comet was eventually going to go, uh, because what we do is we'd never put in something like that comet is going to slam into the uh, into the empire um, if we weren't happy for it to slam into anywhere it could. If if, some, if, if we weren't going to be happy about players dropping it on a Valon or an army or something, we would never have given them the explicit lever that let them do it. Yeah, yeah, you can't put it out there and then go, oh, but not that. <laughs> and that's not to say that they couldn't come up with something of their own, but we judge that on its merits. We tend not to put something in that we think will destroy the game. Because, um, you know, I need games off Steam. Um, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but yeah, so that is, that is plot, kind of. I've rambled a lot. So what do you tell people in the new player meeting? Honestly, we don't talk about plot much. Okay. We probably should. 
Um, I'm aware from the surveys we've done that not as many new players as I'd like to are aware of Winds of War, Winds of Fortune before right. they come. Yep. So promoting those is something that I need to work harder on in the future. But we're, develop we're developing how we promote things all the time. You know, our Instagram has been running for a couple of years and is doing well. We've just started our Twitter account and we're doing more of these videos. So we've just got to keep promoting these things. Um, Anna Reed and, talking about and them. Empire Lab Audio does recordings of all the Winds of War, for example, so you can just yeah. listen to them. Uh, I quite like those. I find them quite restful. Even though I know what's happening because I wrote them, uh, I still like to stick them on in the background when they uh, when they come out, just listen through to them. Um, I, th I think by the time we're talking to the new players in the field, our focus is on making everything okay for them now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not necessarily... And hopefully by their yeah. second event, they'll be aware of all the excitement that comes before an event that they can get involved in, or at the very least, they'll know the people that they can go to. Some of the newspapers, for example, will will have reports on Winds of War. I know the Imperial offices used to do a, a sort of almanac that summarised all the significant events that were happening, depending on how... Well, we're in, interested in a spot with news now, aren't we? Because I think the pledge has stopped. Uh, well, the pledge stopped quite a while ago. It's the uh... Yeah, and the Imperial officers, I don't know what they will be doing anymore. Yeah, but I read the oath right. I get all my news from the oath right. So, if the oath right, to say that. I was going to say thank you. <laughs> but no, I was going to say if the oath right wants to sponsor me in any way, I'll definitely mention you in future videos. As well. um, what, what I particularly like about um, the papers and the synod and the senate is those are physical copies of something that you can, well, not with the stuff that's in the hub, but you can sit down and read to you and digest to yourself. Yeah. You don't have to. Um, do it on the spot um and That's... while we talked about facebook all of the winds of fortune and winds of war will go up will be on the wiki they are reasonably easy to find you just navigate to recent history there's usually a sidebar thinking yeah um uh, yes you're right yes and uh, they can be a fun thing to read while you're on your way to the event assuming you're not driving don't read and drive um no we've got audio for that uh, yes we do but we don't have audio <laughs> on winds of fortune because there's just so many of them Yes. Uh, and it's just unrealistic to try and get them all recorded, um, particularly as we are terrible at getting them all out in plenty of time. Uh, but part of me doesn't want to get them out too early. Like I say, they're about... Well, we did some nice stuff last time, didn't we, where we um, actually got the audio up slightly before some of the Winds of yeah. War. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yes, because we were able to uh, send the Winds of War out to, to Anna, I think. Um, yeah, it was like But the writing on those is very different. The Winds of War all get written in one go. Um, whereas we will write a Wind of Fortune and we will usually publish it so it's off our desk. Hmm. We should probably do a we should probably do one of these uh Clarion in the morning things uh about backgrounds, you know. Yeah, we should do. They're not really also I think plot. it's interesting that we were going to do this one about plot because you thought Winds of War and Winds of Fortune wasn't a big enough topic. Yeah, but it mostly just consisted of me talking about Winds of War and Winds of Fortune, how I write them. It's, it's less a Claire and Andy in the morning and more a Claire interviews Andy about writing Winds of War and Winds of Fortune. Every time I try and make you do some talking, you just dodge it. <laughs> yeah. It's guilt about not having done my three questions yet. Yeah, well, less said about that, the better. Even Matt's done his now. Um, I, I know. So what's your favourite bit of plot that you've seen? Sort of content, user, uh, sorry, organiser-generated versus user-generated content. Mm. I think early on everything that happened with the crown of the three tiers in Winterbark. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, th th that led to some beautiful, beautiful scenes, and obviously the orcs getting scarcened. Yes, yeah, it comes off as a I think was, of that. was was fantastic, and and there were so many layers to why that was fantastic. And it's still having repercussions of the field now. Uh, and it's exactly uh, dog we threw a bane. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what I'm going for. I'm, I know what I'm going you're for. You're going for all the Windmark stuff, because you're... I think Wintermark's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, my civil servant is a Wintermark character. A Suwak Wintermark character. Um, yeah. I think th there's been some big plot lines in Wintermark that the whole nation has bought into. Not all on the same side necessarily, and I think it's, it's a good microcosm of what happens across the game mm. um, but but the beautiful bits of the game are the, like the really tiny things you 
see where you see um, John Amid reading the paper in the forge before he goes into Senate as the Speaker. Or you walk past some weird bit of dramaturgy going on in the League where everybody is acting their hearts out and it's very intense. It, it works you, because yeah. players buy into it. They want to be immersed in in Anvil. And our plot and our Winds of Fortune is about throwing things, throwing as much stuff as we can. We, we do as much plot as we possibly can in every event um, so that you have things to care about or engage with if you're not busy reading a newspaper or visiting the theatre or having an argument about uh, about a Senate motion or the nature of virtue or all the other little things that, that they're constantly churning around in the background that, to make Empire a sort of living world. Yeah, yeah, you've got all the life of the town going on, and then we throw in the. Um, so you the, can uh, you can quite happily play Empire without bit. ever interacting with anything that we've put together beyond the world itself, I guess. Um, and that's something I think is important because we we regularly see players compl not concerned that there is just so much going on and they can't be involved with all of it. Uh, they can't even <laughs> know about all of it and that is realistically that is a design goal from us we want there to be so much going on that no one player can know about or become involved in all of it yeah i can understand why you'd want to know everything and if i was playing i would want to know everything mm. but but you can't there's this there's, there's too much and too many people yeah. to know everything yeah. and, it, and it's like life life in your town you don't know everything that's going on in your town did you you get the highlights out of the paper well, I'd... looking out the window in disgust. <laughs> <laughs> no, they keep doing things without telling me. Oh, that's terrible. You don't have words with <laughs> Well, I don't really understand my town, do I? Because I moved here, then it was winter, then it was lockdown. I know, fair. Yeah, okay. Well, that's, that's brought us all back down to earth with a, with a thumb. Um, yeah, I think that's more or less uh, been a rambling discussion, uh, early morning discussion about plot winds of war winds of fortune i guess yeah is there anything else you want to talk about no i think we've covered that quite nicely okay. this time um so at some point pretty soon somewhere on the screen here is going to appear a link to the plot teams ask me anything that they did earlier this year uh in which um some luminaries from our plot writing team um Asked, answered a bunch of questions from from players about how they write plot and what plot is and what they do and they express uh the whole what is plot thing is significantly better than i do um and also somewhere around here there will be probably <laughs> a uh, a link to a video in which matt and i chat about titles uh which is also plot related because we talk about how uh, the whole idea of elections and titles and levers and players doing things um, helps us build the world and plays into things happening. Um, there's probably a subscription button down there that you should click because I don't know. I don't know what the subscription button does, actually. It means that you get notifications when we post a new video. Great. And there's a bell. So at the end of the last video, I said I should remind <laughs> oh, people to ring God. the bell. I think the bell is the notifications. All right, okay, well, fine. Well, just click everything, basically, because you're, you're meant to say like, subscribe, uh, like, subscribe, follow. like, subscribe, follow, no. share. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. That'll do. You can tell we, we don't are do not this. good at this. We are not good at this at all. Um, and we've also got things. I mean, Claire mentioned the three questions videos earlier. Um, where we're planning to do more video content, uh, just so that you've got something to remind you about how great Empire is. Um, in the uh, in the coming months before we can run again. Um, right, so yeah, that's just covered everything. Excellent. Uh, we should wave at the camera for uh, a few seconds. And do you want to try the jingle again? So when I say three, you should start with Claire and Andy in the morning. Okay. Okay. One, two, three. Claire and Claire Andy, and Andy in, the in the morning. morning. <laughs> yeah, we're getting that was better. awful. We're getting better. We were both in roughly okay. the same okay. time scale there. So anyway, let's wave. So I can cut it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.